You're familiar with the coffee species Arabica, and you're likely familiar with Caffea canephera, known commonly as Robusta. There are over 120 known species of coffee, many of them discovered and described by Dr. Aaron Davis of Kew Gardens. These wild species are indigenous to countries across the world, and in a few cases cultivated and consumed, but most are not viable when it comes to being a global crop species that we might cultivate to ultimately drink and enjoy each morning. There is one species of coffee that I've always been fascinated by. It's called Caffea stenophylla. While many species were never grown and consumed as coffee, this one was. Historically, it grew in West Africa and can be traced back to 1794 in Sierra Leone. It was named in 1834 and characterized as having narrow leaves, which gives the species its name. Its production was centered in Sierra Leone, but it was also grown in Guinea, Ghana, Senegal, Ivory Coast, and even briefly in Uganda. Although it could grow at lower altitudes and despite reports of having excellent taste properties, it fell out of favor due to its poor yield compared to that of Robusta. From the 1940s onwards, production declined, and by the 1980s, it had pretty much vanished. It was one of the descriptions of its taste that stuck with me from the moment I read it. William H. Euchre's book, All About Coffee, first published in 1922, is considered by some to be the seminal and definitive coffee writing of its time. In it, he briefly describes the species Stenophylla. Caffea arabica has a formidable rival in the species Stenophylla. The flavor of this variety is pronounced by some as surpassing that of Arabica. The line stuck with me, and the desire to taste Stenophylla was lodged into my brain, though due to the disappearance of the species, I quickly came to accept it would be one I would never achieve. In 2020, Dr. Aaron Davis was the lead author of a paper describing the work done to try and find Stenophylla again in the wild. Aaron had a jar of Stenophylla beans on his desk that had been collected in 1873 and submitted to Kew, making this something of a passion project for him. A combination of field work in Sierra Leone and genetic analysis was used to hunt it down. What many producers had thought was Stenophylla turned out to be Robusta. But they did manage to find two samples of Stenophylla growing in the wild. Now, Dr. Davis is publishing a follow-up paper written as a collaboration between Kew, Greenwich University, CIRAD, and their partners in Sierra Leone. And this has just been published in Nature. We traveled down to Kew Gardens to speak with him about his latest findings and the potentially huge implications it has for the coffee industry. It, it really was a sort of hair standing up on the back of your neck moment because immediately it's, it was showing those qualities that you, that you require in, in high quality coffee. I've tasted quite a few wild coffees, probably about 20, and generally they're very disappointing. When we actually cupped it, when we tasted it, uh, the most surprising thing was that it tasted like Arabica. And not only did it taste like Arabica, it tasted like a Rwandan Arabica, a Bourbon of, of high elevation, like a high quality coffee. We're, we're in the palm house here at Kew, and you can probably tell it's pretty hot. It's 30 degrees in here, and that is the sort of environment you would expect for Stenophylla. Now, that's quite different to what you'd find in most high quality Arabica growing areas like Ethiopia, where you're, instead of a, of a hot tropical environment like this, we're looking at a cool tropical environment. According to the latest IPCC report, it's unlikely we're going to keep global warming under two degrees C. Even if we get another one degree increase, that is going to be devastating to the coffee sector. This was the exciting thing. Here we had a plant that tasted like Arabica, but is able to grow and produce a crop under much warmer conditions. When we were doing our tasting at, at Union Hand Roasted Coffee in East London, what we didn't realize that the French research group CIRAD were doing the same with a sample that they were growing in La Réunion in Mascarene Islands. As part of the paper, what we did was to do a climate analysis comparing Robusta, Liberica, Arabica, and Stenophylla. And what we found was that Stenophylla will grow in temperatures at six degrees, or even actually up to 6.8 degrees, warmer than Arabica coffee. What we're focusing on is, is the long-term future of coffee production. It's the breeding aspect that's going to be really important. So I, I've been doing coffee research for over 20 years and made lots of interesting discoveries. But for me, I think this is the, the discovery or, or the piece of research that, that we've done that's the most exciting in terms of having an impact long term. At the end of our conversation, Aaron had a little surprise for me. He gave me a small sample of Stenophylla from Sierra Leone that he had left over. I took this back to the roastery to have a proper look. And the first thing we did was to screen out any broken or defective beans from the sample. 
the preparation of this coffee was pretty different to what we would typically see for specialty Arabica coffees. So, in this bowl, 12 grams of Café Estena Philippines, ready to be ground, ready to be brewed, ready to be tasted. Because you'll have watched this video up to this point and you'll be desperate to know what does this taste like. My tasting now is not going to feed into any of the science going on, that, that's already been done. 15, 16 tasting panels have already tasted this and declared it to be good, to be interesting, to be of significance. I'm just going to try and talk about what I'm tasting to try and communicate to you you know, using some frame of reference you might have, exactly how these taste like or, or, or unlike Arabica, or like Robusta, or like Liberica, or anything like that. I'll, I'll try and give you as much context as I can without losing myself in ridiculous coffee tasting language. One interesting thing before I grow in the beans is actually that their shape is quite unusual. They're kind of a teardrop shape, quite pointed at one end and rounded at the other. I'm gonna grind these in a hand grinder just because I wanna minimize any retention an electric grinder might have. Of course, grinding them is gonna be the first moment I really get to kind of interact with how they smell. And I get a pretty good idea at that point. Are they good, are they not? I, I will say my expectations were not super high, having seen the prep, you know, having having seen the journey these beans have taken to get here. If an Arabic had taken a similar journey, I would not have huge expectations. The smell is getting me a little bit excited. There is a kind of very sweet kind of caramel quality to it. There is a little bit of floral kind of aromas in there too. And there's a kind of interesting peachiness to it that's really quite appealing. There is none none of the earthy, woody, rubbery kind of smells that you might expect with other species, species like Robusta, none of the kind of weirdness you might have had if you've tried some of the Libericas out there. At this point, I wouldn't know that it wasn't Arabica, but I'd be wondering what exactly it was because it does smell a little bit different. That is a lot of kind of very fresh peach. I know I'm sounding a little pretentious, go with me. That's really very pretty. So now we'll put it into the cupping bowl, we'll add our weight of freshly boiled water, we'll steep for four minutes, we'll break the crust, we'll clean it off, and then we'll start to taste and we'll have an idea what Stena filler could be and could do for coffee. My first taste of Stena filler. Okay, I'm gonna have another one first up. Talk in a second. One more, one more. When you're tasting like this, you're trying to taste through the layers to get to what the coffee really is. You're trying to taste through a roast that might be slightly imperfect, uh, the processing that might have been slightly imperfect, the prep, all of those things. You're trying to understand what the coffee itself tastes like. I think the first thing that surprises me about this is that when it comes to Arabica, higher grown coffees tend to have this kind of lightness about them. They're not very heavy and, and big. They're quite light and quite delicate. And this reminds me of that. It has a lightness to it. It doesn't have a huge heavy body. It, it's quite light and bright and sweet and, and kind of open and, and fresh tasting almost. A lot of coffees like Robusta or in many cases Liberica have a kind of heaviness to them and opposites to them that's quite harsh and, and aggressive and, and not clean and smooth. This has that, which is really confusing to me. It is not a perfect cup. How could it be a perfect cup looking at the journey that's taken? It has a little harshness to it, but that might be a roast issue or a prep issue. But it is ultimately a clean, sweet tasting coffee that has some acidity. It's got some florality, it's got some fruit to it, a kind of stone fruit, kind of peachy quality that is pleasant, enjoyable. It's a really nice cup. If I drank this, I wouldn't think it wasn't necessarily Arabica. I would presume, my brain would only have presumed that this was Arabica. It is, it is quite similar in quality. The fact that this is from an entirely different species, genetically a long way away from Arabica, is so interesting and so unusual and actually fills me with a great deal of hope. When we think about why this might be exciting as a coffee, there are two reasons. One, the straight passionate consumer in us would want to drink something new and unusual in this species. And 
I would love to taste this, you know, harvested at peak ripeness, processed really carefully, you know, given a, a, a roaster, given a chance to dial in the roast and, and bring the best out of it. That would be exceedingly exciting to taste. But that I think will always be a niche part of this, a small piece of the market. But the idea that that could be possible within the next five years or so is very exciting. I know that's not the instant gratification that we all want and need, but, but five years doesn't feel too far away to be beginning to see this in a coffee shop, for example, and that would be just so cool. The work that is much more interesting and much more important is the work that will outlast the lifetimes of the people doing it now. It's thinking about the long-term future of, of coffee production. This makes me think that there is a chance to have climate resilient, great coffee. It's gonna take a long time, you know, years and years and years. Breeding programs are slow, but I think this is a very exciting beginning to a breeding program that may produce truly excellent, truly climate resilient coffee that hopefully finds a home all over the world for producers who want to grow coffee through the challenges that are coming inevitably. I think we're allowed to feel a little bit excited, feel a little bit positive in the face of what is usually such depressing news of climate change. I think there is potential here for a great future for specialty coffee. But now I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. What unanswered questions do you have about Caffea stenophylla? I'll try and answer as many of them as I can down in the comments. Leave them there, leave your questions. I'd love to hear from you. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day.